Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 489 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, I'm talking with Dirk Stachke. His recent work draws from Dutch Vanitas paintings, often incorporating ceramic frames that act as portals into the inner world of the sculpture. In our interview, we talk about exploring dark humor and beauty at the same time, as well as having the patience for new ideas to solidify. If you'd like to see examples of his work, you can go to his website, That's artdirk.com. I wanted to take a minute and thank the folks that have made donations to the podcast. We are listener supported, so I'd like to thank David Klingingsmith and Julie McKell for their recent contributions. If you'd like to get involved, you can do that at patreon.com slash redclayrambler. There are lots of perks for Patreon members, including exclusive access to episodes that are no longer available on major podcast apps. Again, that website is patreon.com slash redclayrambler. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Well, let's start with Portland. We were just talking about that before we turned the mics on. How did you end up being there, and what is it like to be an artist there? Me and my wife were living in Vancouver, BC, and I was teaching uh, halftime at Emily Carr, and she was working for a company called Lululemon. And uh, we had several friends that lived here in Portland, and we'd first come here, you know, over 20 years ago, and I was like, ah, wouldn't that be great to live there? And then we just kind of made it happen. Yeah. And it was a good time because, um, It was only a couple of years after the economic collapse, so things were still affordable, and so we managed to get our foot in the door that way. So, yeah, it was was a good move. We were talking before also just about how cities change. This is a gross generalization, but, you know, in the 1900s, as industry grew, cities grew. And then now, you know, in the 20th century, as industry shrank, cities shrank. So how does Portland fit into that? Like, do you see Portland as something on the way up, on the way down, in the middle? It's interesting because we keep losing our artistic institutions. You know, we lost, we had a craft museum. We had um, School of Arts and Crafts, which was a big one. Um, And then schools keep consolidating and ditching their ceramics programs or they'll start, they somebody will pass on and then they won't get a full-time hire um, for years, if at all. So I think, you know, in the arts directly as that affects the city, I think that that seems to be in decline, but then um, there's not a lot of good paying jobs here. you know what I mean? So there's a couple of bigger companies that employ people who have, better than average incomes but outside of that um it seems the thing that's propping up the real estate market is people from california move up here um and they have a bunch of money and i'm not saying that's a bad thing i'm not going one way or the other on that but you know up until a couple of years ago it was really affordable to buy a house here and now since the work from home movement uh that's become it's it's made property values really go up well, I, I want to go back and, and talk about your work. We're going to jump around sequentially and, and talk about a few different things. The first stuff I ever saw of yours was years ago when you were making figurative work. Oh, wow. And there were some similarities in the way you approach the figure then to the way you approach other elements now. So one of the things, for instance, there was a sculpture, Consuming Allegory. This was 2012. And that piece, it's not figurative in the same sense as that your previous work was like the human figure, but there are two geese that are 
symmetrically aligned so they're up in the air. There's like a ham hock that's been cut in half on both sides. There's fruit. Like there's this a sense of grandiosity and also that you're capturing something that would rot if it was not ceramic. Like if all that stuff was real, it would smell horrible after a day or two. <laughs> so can you talk about the similarities between what you learned from being a figure sculptor and then what went into that sort of early 2010s work and how those connect? The figurative work, you know, it's funny because Anybody who works in ceramics understands that there's still this way of building that revolves around vessel making and that things can't be solid. They have to be hollow on the inside. All of my figures in the beginning were made this way with slabs um, that were sort of coil built around. And um, in that technique, you really have to know what you're doing because once you get to a certain point, you can't really go back and change what's at the bottom. Um, so working in ceramics this way um, is pretty difficult. But I think um, conceptually, the, the things that were figurative had to do, they also had architectural ornament in them, and they had to do with... Um, how we as individuals kind of fit into this larger context of society. Um, and I was thinking about that more because I was living in New York City at the time. And, you know, it was, it occurred to me that you can be, say, on the subway and surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of people. And yet you don't really acknowledge each other's presence. So I, I guess I was kind of, you know, one way of talking about it was that I was kind of feeling alone in those moments. But yet, if you lived in a, say, a rural area, everybody there kind of makes it their business to know your business, which is completely opposite. So in a way, you're kind of, I was kind of, the paradox of being more alone in a crowd is kind of what uh, prompted that work. So it was like, you know, um, how does the individual fit into this larger context of a greater society? And I think, um, you know, a lot of people are still thinking about that and making work about that these days also. Um, as it relates to the more uh, Vanitas oriented work, I just took that way of making and then would uh, create multiples of things that I could just kind of attach into larger structures. Um, the earlier Vanitas work that you've mentioned, um, it did have that grandiose feeling. And there was also a bit of symmetry in that work that I think also related to the architectural uh, aspects, you know, of, of being derived from architecture, there's usually a symmetry involved in the decoration of buildings. And I think I was carrying that over um, in a way. Do you know, um, do you know the artist and teacher Paul Matu? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember Paul, I was teaching and he saw that work and he's like, I hate that work. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> and I, we had a great relationship. So he could just come right out and tell me that sort of stuff. And, um, I feel like he had a point because uh, he didn't like the symmetry. And for me, the symmetry was a way of making something a little more grotesque, kind of palatable. Um, bringing, like, symmetry is one of those things we're hardwired to associate with beauty. So I was trying to take something in some of those that were, you know, maybe a little gross and yet make it kind of decorative, kind of like a, um, if you a cross between say like a, a mice in soup terrine and um, a vanitas painting with of like a butcher shop or something, and I think from the painting world, composition, the organization of space and composition is something that even people that are not artists understand. Like when you walk into a museum, if I take my grandmother into a museum, she can actually point out compositions, which is interesting because. That's not always, it's almost like that part of art is just soaked into the broader culture. But then when you make it 3D, somehow 
it, it, I don't want to say it confuses people, but there is a need for the same thing. Like people almost need composition. They need a structure and organization. And as you mentioned, sym- symmetry makes it palatable so that it doesn't just look like, at least in the, in the case of that piece, like that a bunch of random things were, were, were stacked together because they're not random. <laughs> well, in- interestingly enough, though, that's what Paul was objecting to in the work. Like he didn't like the symmetry in the work, which um, I kind of jettisoned that later as the work evolved. Well, let's um, think about the earlier work. You, you talked about how the figurative sculpture that one of the things you you incorporated was architectural elements that have straight edges. So you have this sense of the built structure of life, which living in New York City is like everywhere. And then you had these soft human forms. So there was kind of the contrast between the vulnerability of skin and a really sharp column, for instance, if some of those pieces had columns that were incorporated into them. The figures, they seem like marble, but they also seem like vulnerable at times, like the human aspects were vulnerable. I would say, I think the reason they felt vulnerable is because they weren't in heroic poses. They were in everyday kind of people just relaxing sort of poses. Where they started to get my points across is that as they evolved, I started to basically get rid of any sort of... um, indication that it was an identity of an actual person. So for instance, you know, parts of the face would turn into ornament or, um, you know, there'd be sections of the ornament that obscured the, um, I guess, individuality of that person. And for me, that was kind of how I was getting at that, that notion of um, how is it that the individual relates or fits into the larger society? and I think, you know, you you touched on it because um, there is a vulnerability in that work. But I think it's usually sometimes sometimes it feels as though the architecture is actually inflicted upon the individual. And I think their their poses and postures are the things that helped kind of ground them in the everyday and not look like, you know, monuments to specific heroic people and that sort of thing. I, I wanted to mix in the work you're doing now, which is kind of a couple, it's still the, the Vanitas um, body of work, but it's, I feel like it's a very different way of making than say that consuming allegory piece. Can you just talk about the structure of a painting frame and how that's interesting to you? Cause you've really taken the frames of things, making them into ceramic and making them, um, sort of the most obvious use of ornament in the the newer parts of that body of work. Yes, and I think that's, it's funny because, well, I'll just talk on for a minute here. Um, you know, when you tackle something as cliche as the gilded frame, um, I was very aware, you know, when I was doing that, and I wanted to find a way to kind of rejuvenate that as an object. Uh, Ironically, when people see the work who aren't ceramic people, uh, unfortunately, they assume that I just found a frame (laughs) and put it on there. And I think um, that's one of the uh, pitfalls of making things that are hyper-realistic in ceramics is that the layman uh, doesn't necessarily understand that that was actually a handmade thing that was made you know, basically from mud and created in a sense to try to fool the eye. I think why I gravitated, I mean, I gravitated to the frames for several reasons. I mean, obviously they're just beautiful objects on their own. Like sometimes when I'm in a museum, I find myself looking at the frames as much as I am looking at the paintings. And then I think um, it also, it takes the work back to a time it helps reference that history and then thirdly uh it helps set up an illusion and uh that's something that's something that i've become more interested in you know as the years have gone on is 
kind of trying to create uh, an experience for the viewer, um, one that kind of takes them out of the here and now. And hopefully, um, if I'm successful, there's some sort of metaphysical gestalt going on where they question uh, reality and then they also um, are left there kind of dumbfounded in a way by what's happening with the materials and how I move from something that's hyper-realistic to basically the inside of the pot or the or the sculpture, right? You know, there we are back to potter space, that inside space. And for me, revealing that that inside space is a way of taking people out of their comfort zone and also surprising them. But um, I kind of, I in, in that body of work, I was kind of doubling, doubling the whammy factor in that. Um, have you ever, have you ever had a dream within a dream? Hmm. No. Never? So mm -hmm. you've never like had this moment where you're like, oh God, this is a horrible effing dream and I want to wake up. And then you wake up and then you're like, Oh, thank God it's over. Then you go, you realize somehow you wake up again. You're like, oh shit, that was two. I was in two <laughs> different dreams. So I kind of want the viewer to have a similar experience when they see these where, you know, across the gallery, it's conceivable at first that that could be a painting. And as they approach it, they say, oh, okay, yeah, it's a sculpture of a painting. And then as they move around it, they say, Oh, holy shit, there's this has all been exploded outward to where the process is now exposed. And what were the inner guts of the sculpture are now on the outside. So there's hopefully if I'm successful, there's a space where they realize through this deception that like things are not always as they seem. And for me, that's in my own life, that's kind of realizations that I've had, you know, as I've gotten older um, in the world. And I've kind of wanted to take that feeling and kind of put it into work or into artwork. What art did you grow up with or even experience as an adult that gave you that feeling, like things were not as they seemed? Um, well, anecdotal story. Um, my parents in our house, you know, we had we had like a modern ranch, uh, cheaply made in the mid '60s sort of space in Alabama, and um, my parents had that painting or a copy of a painting, not even you know a print of a painting that was um, the Man with the Golden Helmet by that was originally attributed to Rembrandt. They don't think he made it anymore, but. They had this painting in there. And uh, you know, as a kid growing up, it's like, ah oh, man, look how cultured my parents are. Holy crap. <laughs> and then as friends would come over, everybody who came over would say, Man, that guy looks just like your dad, the guy in the painting. I'm like, yeah, that's that is odd. He does look like my dad. And over time, after questioning my parents, it's like it had nothing to do with being cultured at all. My dad realized that he looked like this guy. <laughs> so it was like a vain, it was like a vain attempt to like, Oh, look, it's like associate, associate himself with uh, antiquity or something. I don't know. It's kind of funny, but um, I think about that painting a lot. Um, when I think about Dutch still life paintings, and that was kind of my introduction to Dutch still life paintings as a young boy. Um, and then your other part of the question was, um, did you ever have an experience with a piece of art that is the experience you're trying to create for others? I think consistently, like when I would see like somebody like Tim Hawkinson's work, I don't know if you're familiar with him. A lot of the work, a lot of stuff I look at isn't necessarily ceramic. He, he's probably best known for these things called these Uber organs. It would be a whole museum full of these giant gas bags that would fill up to a point and then they'd have to release somewhere else in the gallery and they would create these noises that would go off seemingly sporadically as, as time went by. But I think 
he had this really DIY kind of aesthetic. Like he would make stuff out of anything. So basically these organs were made out of um, like fishing net and um, thin plastic, but it was clear plastic and they were giant. So each one of these organs, the, the gas part would be, you know, like eight foot tall by like 15, 20 feet long. And then they would go through these series of pipes throughout the gallery. And then when the pressure would build up, these uh, horns were basically made out of cardboard and some sort of reed he'd fabricated with um, like duct tape and all these other things. And I think um, like his work really kind of gets to some of the things I was, you know, I wanted to think about in my work. He had this one piece that was basically, it was a series of gears that were made out of um, blue foam and more of that uh, silver tape that they used, the, the higher end duct tape. And uh, you could see the smaller gear moving and it was powered by some dinky little clock. But as each gear got bigger, he had figured out how to basically approximate millions of years so that the viewer would never actually see the millions of years. You would just have to trust and take it for granted that he was telling you the truth, that eventually each way these gears was um, geared would eventually create one revolution on that larger one in a million years. Huh. So I think there was like that, there was like a leap of faith in there that I appreciated when viewing his work, you know, and um, I mean, in my work, I feel if it is successful, it's when people pause, you know, and they have uh, that moment where they're, where they're questioning what they're seeing, even though they might not know exactly what they're seeing. And for me, I feel like that's what's most important in my work. And that's, um, it has the same effect on me as I figure it out, you know, cause I don't go into it knowing that's like, Oh, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I mean, sometimes it's half and half. Sometimes I know, and then sometimes it's just kind of feeling your way through it. And I find for me, that's the most successful way of working. Some of the physical elements of this are, are that when you're looking at a lot of these sculptures, if you look at them straight dead on to the picture frame, it does look like a painting, like you're looking into a painting. And then as you walk around the side, you get to this confusing point where sometimes, at least in the videos I've seen, I can't tell what's happening. And then when you get to the exact opposite side of the picture frame, so like a front and back binary, then there's some other sculptural element, whether it's pots or something else that is beautiful. So you have like recognizable beauty, confusion, beauty. <laughs> or at least that's like the experience of moving around the object. And there's something about that as you're talking about your intuitive process of making that I can understand as an artist. You know, like you you take the leap of faith in your own studio and hopefully you get to something beautiful, but maybe not. <laughs> True. That's the scary part about making art. You know, learning to accept failure is an important part, not just for artists, but for all of us. And, um, you know, as an artist, you will have failure. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Hi, I'm Kara, content creator and Facebook wrangler for Amico Brent bringing you ideas and support for your creative adventures every day. This week's episode is brought to you by Amico Brent. Find your favorite Amico glaze at your local distributor. Happy glazing! Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration, featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit rosenfieldcollection.com. Well, I wanted to think a little bit about Alabama and, and you being from there. 
in any human environment, when you look out into the forest, it is a dense experience. Like there's kudzu, well, depending on where you're at, yeah. there might, you know, there might be kudzu. There's sometimes there's pine trees growing together. Like it, it's so vibrant. Like there's so much growing that there's also so much dying at exactly the same time. Like that's the nature of humidity in that type of landscape. And I think there's something about that with Vanitas paintings in general. Like it looks like things are like at the maximum point of growth before they're starting to decay. And I think there's something like interesting about that in your work. Like, is this really beautiful because you're freezing it in time in the same way that the old painters did? Or are you actually showing us decay and making decay beautiful? So can you talk a little bit about that, like this idea of growth and decay and how you, you think about it in the work? Wow. Okay. Um, well, it's interesting because any sort of growth or decay is only implied. It's not an actual physical action in my work. So I think the viewer, depending on which pieces they're looking at, there's some that have decay and there's some that just have growth. And maybe some that have a little bit of both. Hashtag rhyming. Um, <laughs> so those are things that the viewer probably would think about, but it's it's inherent in Vanitas already that those two, you know, that dichotomy is going to be there. And I think, um, you know, anybody who's made it out of high school has probably started to consider, you know, mortality at some point. Um, you know, when you're young, the world is beautiful and you're invincible and nothing bad will ever happen. You know, your grandma is still alive. All your cats are still alive. Um, as you get older, it becomes a different story. I think that decay is inevitable. And I've started thinking about things in different ways, um, like more like maybe a physicist would or um, somebody more knowledgeable than me. But nowadays, it kind of feels like when I when I think about everything that's happening in the world and I think about having a child, which changed my life profoundly, it's all just kind of a transfer of energy. And if I had heard that come out of my mouth, say, 20 years ago, I'd be like, <laughs> shut up, hippie. But it's, you know, there's only so much energy to go around, which is, you know, partially why we're having the issues we're having. And um, I, I'd like to think that as you, when you pass on, that energy that you possess moves out into the universe and becomes whatever else. Um, you know, that's that's the metaphysical side of it. The literal side is, you know, you are what you eat. So that there's that literal transference of energy from whatever, you know, and all the things you ate from a plant to an animal um, all indirectly got their energy from the sun and, you know, photosynthesis and the trickle down of that effect. So that's kind of been a profound change of thought that I've had. I have a new secret body of work that I've been working on for two years. And I'm honestly, I'm like petrified to put it out there. <laughs> I'm hoping that in some way it speaks to that. So we'll see. I might chicken out last minute. No, no, it's, I'm going to let it out there soon. So we'll see. <laughs> well, I, I, I like that you have the forethought to work on something for two years and not let it out into the world. Because I think sometimes the hustle of an early career artist, which you're not, but you know, the hustle of an early career is like, oh God, I got to send this to the next show. I got to sell this. I got to do it. It's like, it's the rat race. You know, like you feel like I got to do more, more, more. But I think one of the values of being a mid-career artist is, is that you can see outside of yourself and, <laughs> and save this work back until it resolves itself or for whatever reason that you're, you know, you're, you're doing that. But I think it's like that patience is amazing. <laughs> I, I commend you on having that patience. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, it was, um, there was a lot of technical challenges in the new work and I needed to kind of overcome that. And then 
there was also um, the upheaval of COVID, which basically meant that I, I took a whole year off, a year and a half off from working, which is the first time I'd ever taken a break like that since I was in high school. So I've been a maker for, you know, 30, 30 something, 35, 37 years, 32 at least. And um, it was weird to have that break, um, but it was necessary because the schools were closed and I needed to take care of my daughter and help her through um, homeschooling and, you know, doing all these other things to entertain her. So as much as it hurt, uh, having that experience in the, in the studio, it was actually a valuable experience, you know, spending time with my daughter. So it's kind of a give and a take there, but taking, yeah, taking the time, I think as you were talking about is also um, very much something that technology doesn't allow anymore. You know, we had all this, this technology come along and everybody for the longest time was going, oh, it's gonna free us. And I remember being the naysayer and being made fun of you know, <laughs> like 15, 20 years ago. And it's like, no, it's going to imprison us. And I think people are finally starting to wake up to that. And one way, for instance, that you know it can imprison an artist is that instead of making your art, you're constantly in search of that dopamine hit from the likes of posting, which means you're posting more and more and more. There's no time, you know, you're posting every little thing that you figured out to the point to where if anybody's following you, that when you actually have what is seemingly a revelation in your work, it, it loses all power in my mind. Um, not to mention the, the stress of having to post every day, you know, to, to grow your followers and all that. Um, would I like more followers? Sure. Am I going to spend the time? That it takes probably not. It's funny that we're talking about social media because one of the ways I researched you was to read through your social media, and one of the things that I like is that you do actually write captions that you're explaining something you learned from the piece or that you had some, you know, understanding that came from it. And and one of them you were talking about that you had a piece that had come back after being in a series of exhibitions for years. I can't remember how many years it was, but it was a long time. And then the piece comes back, and one of the things you said is, someone offered to buy this years ago, and I didn't sell it because I was worried that I wasn't going to have enough work for future shows. And somewhere in there you put, like, I was such an idiot. <laughs> I should yeah. have just <laughs> sold the piece. <laughs> Which, for me, as someone researching you, I could I could relate to that. But could you talk a little bit about that, like, sort of the career of being an artist and managing how many how much work you need to have for a big solo show versus how much work you can actually sell and how museums fit into that as well? Oh, I don't know. Um, I've been having certain reservations about career paths in the last couple of years. In a good year, I make as much as like a high school teacher. And that's a good year. And then there's bad years. And then there's COVID years. So um, I don't know. You know, we want art has become its own sort of thing that perpetuates itself. It's a machine. And, you know, it's the universities help perpetuate it. And in order to be a true or in order to be a studio artist, you have to believe or you have to be what I would consider a true believer, right? Like you have to believe in art. And I will confess that over the years, um, especially the last three or four years, I've become a little more jaded about art and the art world. And I think part of that is also due to social media because you're constantly bombarded by it now. It's lost its specialness for me. And I think also, um, it's accelerated the production of art in that um, as soon as somebody comes up with something novel, there's now within weeks, there's people doing that same thing. And I think anybody who's ever been to um, like an art fair, like Art Miami, 
will know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, there'll be one year, there'll be the guy who's doing the infinity mirror artwork. The next year, there'll be five people doing that, <laughs> you know? And um, I think that also happens with social media. So that um, if somebody winds up being successful, then there's a bunch of other people that go like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do that too. Um, which is hard for the guy who, or the a woman or whoever, the person who, um, you know, might've put their blood, sweat and tears in the studio into developing that. And then um, somebody, you know, maybe a little better known, you know, first to market, I guess, if we're gonna look at art now as a marketable object, but, you know, there's always a danger you're gonna become the Blackberry to the iPhone. You know, <laughs> if you put everything out there too quickly, um, so I, you know, I missed the time where I didn't think about that, where I didn't think about having to put the work out there on social media, where I could just take two years, make a body of work and then show it at a gallery. And that would be the first time anybody had seen it. Um, I feel like I'm digressing The the original question <laughs> was. No, let, let's keep digressing because <laughs> actually I, I want to think about this idea of being jaded, but working through that in the studio, you're making work in some instances that is literally about death, which is in some ways you could say like, oh, that's really jaded. You know, like that's <laughs> not, <laughs> that's not hopeful, quote unquote, but your work doesn't seem dark. And I guess this is the, the, the thing you, you can tackle really dark subject matter but it somehow seems beautiful. Can you talk about that? Like sort of dealing with darkness in yourself and how you deal with that through making, but also not making artwork that's so damn dark that you can't look at it. <laughs> Cause sometimes I do see art that's so dark that I'm like, Whoa, like that is. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Cause people in general don't want anything to do with negativity. And I think if we're being honest, if people would be more negative, there would be more of a consensus about what we have to do to change the planet. But I think a lot of that is people, people push away negativity all the time. And death is a negative thing. Um, I personally um, have been through some times where um, in a five-year period, so I lost my brother-in-law and both my parents and also my son. And, you know, those were each on their own very dark times. Um, and then being pushed closer together within a five-year period made it especially a hard thing to deal with. Um, but I think, you know, as time goes on, you process, you move on you hopefully come away from those experiences um, seeing things in a new light, um, which is a constant struggle for me not to get kind of taken down by the minutia of life. So any traumatic experience that anybody lives through can be taken as a positive thing. If you look at it in the right way, you realize all the things you have to be thankful for, and you realize that you also maybe need to change the things that are negative in your life, which is easier said than done because I've, I've had that experience a million times, not a million times, but figuratively a million times, uh, only to, you know, years later kind of let life itself kind of bring you back down. Um, so, I mean, for me, the act itself of making um, gives life purpose because I think what I would tell anyone is that realistically life has no purpose except for what you bring to it. What you believe it is, is what you can hopefully make it become. And without that belief, um, you're doomed if you give up, right? So that's also like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you give up you and think that life is crappy, you're going to have even a crappier life than you would have if you had tried. On one level, that's, for me, the making gives my life purpose. Um, uh, on another on another level, there's I find my work kind of humorous. It's kind of a dry 
dark humor in some ways. It's not always obvious. Some, you know, some of the literal ceramic paintings that I make are um, rendered meticulously only to have the process take that away. So for me, there's a kind of humor in, in a self-defeating gesture. But I'm, it's like the gesture is self-defeating, but you continue onward anyways. Um, kind of a Sisyphean moment, I suppose. So I find humor in that. And I don't know if that humor necessarily comes across in the work, but it's there for me. Well, this is a good segue, actually, to some of the vessels that have these amazing paintings in glaze on the surface of things. And then when you fire them, everything gets soft and it all starts to run. I know as a ceramic artist how long it takes you to do that. <laughs> but I think sometimes people that aren't artists, like they might not understand at all. So what do you think about the value of your labor in that sense, specifically with those pots, those vessels in which you're like spending hours like laying in little bits of glaze? The labor on the framed sculptural painting pieces is a lot more than on the pots, but the pots are still time consuming. So I value, I value trying to do things that haven't been done, or at least I don't perceive they've been done. You know, it's really hard in this day and age to do anything truly original. But like, for instance, the techniques that I use in those vases are informed by a series of mistakes and then also testing, like testing, testing, testing. And as far as I know, no one has created vases or ceramics using the exact technique that I figured out. And basically a lot, most of what it owes its strangeness to is it's building up highlights in reverse, like say the same way you would, you remember when you were, the kid and the teacher would have you uh, color a sheet of paper with crayons and then go over it with ink so that as you scratch away, it reveals. Well, it's not quite like that, but it is, it's about um, putting a lighter surface on a darker ground. So I'm building up porcelain on red clay. So that's what's actually forming the painterly surface underneath that. And then after that's fired, or bisque, I have to go back and repaint all of that again with matching glazes. Okay. And then it's fired again. And then it's fired a third time to overfire it. So that's what's actually making everything let go. Um, and as far as I know, um, that's mine. You know, I don't know. And, and, it feels good. Like it feel, I think that's where I find enjoyment. Most of the enjoyment that I find in the studio is like being a mad scientist, you know, inventing, trying to invent something, you know, and as you're, as you're younger, your reference points are less. So you think you're inventing, but <laughs> as you see more and more you go like, okay, Oh wait, that's been done. That's been done. Um, what if I just go off and like see where the process takes me and pay attention in that moment to little things and then take that little thing and blow it up. Like just make that little thing that you found in the test tile, the thing that you're going to pursue. And for me, that's, you know, how I came up with the technique that's used on the vases. And I'm now I'm questioning whether I actually answered your question or not. <laughs> well, that's all right. I, I was I, I was latching into the the third firing where you overfire it. I I have had this pot that I this jug that I couldn't give up on, and I fired that sucker like five times, and it got to where the glaze was. It's the most beautiful glaze I've ever seen, but it ran and stuck to the shelf. And so as a pot, it's horrible. It doesn't work anymore. But there's something about like being committed to firing. You know, like I'm just going to fire the hell out of this thing until it looks beautiful. That is such a ceramic idea. <laughs> Sometimes that's where the best stuff happens, right? But it's not, it's not always repeatable unless you figure it out, right? Right. 
I've taught at several different levels and at the more serious levels, I would encourage all of my students to keep copious notes on everything because lo and behold, critique time comes around and they've got something magical, but no way to replicate it. So yeah, I'm a big proponent of keeping notes. I've got several uh, notebooks myself that are just filled with chicken scratch of things that some of which, you know, 90% of which was useless. But if I hadn't written it down, I wouldn't have known, you know, if it, something did turn out. Well, I wanted to wrap up thinking about how you work in the studio to generate the best ideas, you know, like when you have the aha moments, but then also how you structure that into an actual exhibition. So it seems like about every two years, every year and a half, something like that, you have a pretty big show that has, you know, a lot of work that you're showing at the same time. So how do you balance kind of that desire to get the big idea and then when you're going to show it? Yeah, it's funny because I feel, um, I feel like, Maybe my career would be further along if I had just stuck with my first ideas and not <laughs> moved along. Maybe I maybe I suffer from ADD or or maybe I just as you figure the work out, it loses the mystery and the magic. And so I think I'm addicted to figuring things out. I think that's the true art for me. And you know, if I make something we'll say five to 10 years is kind of the window of which I bodies of work have flown. As long as I can find some sort of common thread between them, um, it might not be obvious in the way that art historians like it to be obvious. They're like, Oh, look, you know, it, look at this thread of work that, you know, it was in little tiny increments. For me, it's more, I'll, wear something out and I'll, I'll pull a thread of what I feel is worn out and then take that little piece of it and try to develop it into a whole new body of work. And that's kind of the way, the way I work. And I don't know if that's, you know, some people don't like that way of working, but it's, it's how I work and I've just accepted it. Um, so as far as, you know, getting lost in the studio and then trying to make sense out of that stuff for a show. For me, it takes time. Um, you know, obviously it gets easier as you make the work because then you, you figure out what works and what doesn't. And then you're like, Oh yeah, now I'm just doing a variation of something that worked before. And I think that's great. And I usually do that for a while, but then obviously that, is kind of where for me it loses steam and the excitement and the studio goes away. I think if I could, if I could think about these, these pieces more as commodities, I'd probably be more successful as an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's also a luxury that academia gives where you have a day job and you don't need to sell the work. And, um, so I, I kind of wonder if maybe I should have done that at some point. I don't know. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of struggling out artists out there that just have day jobs and they clamor for that time in the studio. And that's a really difficult boat to be in. Um, I, I, I'm thankful. I'm truly thankful for the time that I've had in the studio and that time to explore and kind of figure things out at each stage and each um, new movement of my work that I had that time to kind of figure it out. I'm also thankful, you know, for the people who believed in me and the shows that I've had with different galleries and museums and that sort of thing. So that's, that's a very, you know, blessed place to be. And I'm, I'm really thankful for it. And I'm hoping um, that I can continue that with this newer body of work that is going to be coming out soon. Part of this, I think, is having gallerists that you trust, you know, that you can get feedback from them about the shape of the show or maybe, like, how many pieces is in a show. Because I think about, like, your when your work is in a mocha, like, that space is gigantic. 
Like, I don't know how big the main gallery space is, but it's it's really big. But if you're in a New York City show or any any city show, you might only be able to have four or five pieces, but those can have more punch. Somehow having less pieces in a show, sometimes that can be the thing that creates more impact. So I think some of that is the gallerist role to kind of point you in a direction like, hey, let's just do three. So yes, you're right. Museum space determines the type of show you're going to have. I think um, the Emoka show was great because I was the inaugural person or artist in that gallery, in that gallery space. They just finished it and it was a giant space. And I felt, you know, for me, it was great because it felt almost like, like a 10 year retrospective or something. And I was very honored to have that, you know, that, that show in, in that space. Thank you, Amoka. <laughs> To wrap up, can you leave either your website or social media so people could get in touch if they want to? Oh, sure. That'd be great. Um, having having my last name is kind of a curse. Um, so on Instagram, it is um, at Dirk underscore Stashke or at D-I-R-K underscore S-T-A-S-C-H-K-E. And then uh, my website is artdirk.com. I did not want to include my last name in my website. It's a lot of consonants. Well, when I was looking you up, actually, it's funny because Dirk Nowitzki is what, when you type in Dirk, that's what kept coming up into Google for any basketball fans out there. (laughs) Uh Well, thanks, man. This was a a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Uh, Ben, thank you so much for having me. It was uh, really an honor to be on here and thank you for thinking of me. I'd like to thank Dirk for coming on the show. It was a pleasure to chat with him and hear more about his thoughts and process. Before we go, I'd like to thank today's sponsors. That's Amico Brent, the Archie Bray Foundation, and the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor on the show, you can get in touch through our website. That's brickyardnetwork.org. Also wanted to give a plug for the Clay and Color podcast, which is relaunching for their third season. Alex Anderson and Angelique Viscarando Leboy will be talking to 18 emerging and established artists of color who are helping to shape the field of ceramics today. If you're interested in finding out more about the show, it's available on all major podcast apps, or you can go to the website, which is brickyardnetwork.org slash clay and color. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.